It seems appropriate to announce that next year's season uh, will be fully um, online and uh, available by the end of June. But as a sneak peek, we have Dr. Kate Mulligan, a professor and senior director of Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing, delivering a, a webinar next season, as well as Sherry Dupuy, a professor in recreation therapy from the University of Waterloo, and also um, does a lot of work with the Bitov method. And, uh, uh, the format will stay the same next season, the second Wednesday of every month, with industry experts, our full roster to be announced um, by the end of June. Uh, you get continuing education hours uh, for attending the virtual sessions. Um, you register through Eventbrite, and uh, we are very uh, thankful for the George Lunan Foundation, and with their support, we're able to offer these amazing professional sessions for free. So again, um, we are announcing our upcoming season. So just a reminder that part of our learn, um, part of the learn section of room 217 is actually a membership. You can become a member to learn. And uh, with that, you get a 30% discount on all of our learning uh, programs, an annual subscription to connect. That's our app where you'll find all of our resources. And uh, you get to attend three 90 minute uh, master classes per year for free as part of that cost. And also the, uh, the half day master class coming up in August. And again, I mentioned this because we're announcing a whole roster of new and upcoming things. Um, specifically our conference, I'll speak a little bit, bit more about that, is in person in BC. Uh, <laughs> which seems appropriate with uh, Deborah Sheets with us here today from BC, but our conference will be Saturday, November 5th. You can attend um, in person if you want, and or you can attend uh, hybrid front virtually. And so just in general, um, the in person, the early bird will be somewhere around $110. Um, if you apply after, it'll be about $130. And um, if you are hybrid, it'll be probably around the $75 mark. And we have a new virtual learning studio on mu music and resiliency, professional and personal resiliency, which is fabulous. It's going to be released in on June 22nd. And also upcoming in August, we have our half day or three hour masterclass, um, which will be Thursday, August 18th from nine till 12. And again, here's a little bit more info about our conference. We're super excited to have many friends from BC and also um, Dr. Karine Tout from uh, U of T, the Neurologic Music Therapy Program. We have Dr. Heather Mohan as uh, one of our addresses, and the unbelievable Susan of Lukark, who just won a humanitarian award at the Junos. So the masterclass, uh, one of our webinars actually was really uh, popular with Emily Folks, who gave um, a, a description about singing for health network, singing and breathing. And so she's going to come back because of the positive feedback and talk about the tips and tricks. It's more of a tooling up for uh, caregivers. And as well, we're going to hear a little inspirational story from Amy Linhausen, the RN from Ottawa, who made the news during COVID by singing at the bedside of patients. So again, that's Thursday, August 18th, 9 in the morning till noon. It's free if you're a Learn and Certify member, and it's it's 15 to 20 dollars for others and our upcoming training level one we have a september 2021 level two there is a level two tomorrow so if you're really eager you may still be able to grab a spot however if not october 21st or 22nd and level three kicks off september 12th and so who do we have with us today um, well, this is Deborah Sheets, as I said before, and she is um, going to be talking about the Voices in Motion Choir, which is an arts-based, high-quality music engagement program designed to foster intergenerational relationships. Dr. Deborah Sheets is a professor in the School of Nursing at the University of Victoria and an elected fellow at the American Academy of Nursing, the Gerontological Society of America, and the Association for Gerontology in Higher Education. Her research interests focus on gerontology and, in particular, dementia 
Dementia, Caregiving, and Humanities and Arts and Aging. Dr. Sheets is one of the lead researchers for the Voices in Motion Choir, again, an intergenerational choir for people with dementia and their family caregiver that is reducing social isolation and the stigma of dementia. So thank you for joining us today. And on that note, I'll send it over to you. Okay, it's such a pleasure to be with you today. And I apologize, I'm sitting outside um, in a breezy area. <laughs> I'm visiting my 87 year old mom and I just dropped her off for a hearing aid test and I had to find a place with Wi-Fi to do this presentation. I'm so excited to be with you. Um, I think the work that Music Care is doing is so important. And Dr. Mulligan is um, someone that I'm collaborating with around social prescribing across the country. And um, as well, Dr. Dupuy is doing amazing work. So I encourage you to sign up for those presentations. Yeah, so today I get to talk with you a little bit about how a choir can actually move the needle on stigma and on social isolation. And I'm excited to share with you some of the results of probably the most rigorous um, choir study of the impacts of participating um, in social singing for people living with dementia, their care partners, and introducing something truly unique, an intergenerational component. So before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the people in the land. Um, I live, work, and play uh, in the territories of the Lepungan, Songhees, and Esquimalt peoples. This is actually a picture of Tafina, one of my favorite places. Um, and I think it just shows, you know, how much we have to be grateful for um, in terms of the lands that we get to, to work and play on. So, okay, a little outline about what I'd like to go over today. Um, I'll be talking for about half an hour, and then I'd like to allow some time for any questions you may have, any comments, um, a little bit of discussion. But I thought I'd provide a little bit of background first on Canada's dementia strategy, not knowing how familiar you might be with that. Talk a little bit about dementia and stigma and the impact that has on social isolation. Then turn our attention to the power of music, like why music, why not other arts? Um, why did we choose a choir, um, particularly for people living with dementia? I'll present some findings, quantitative and quantitative from our study, and then do a little bit of discussion and next steps. Okay, first to begin with a little bit of background. There's currently over half a million Canadians living with dementia. The numbers are gonna nearly double by 2030. And people living with dementia, uh, dementia adversely purport, disproportionately affects women more than men because women live longer and the rates of dementia increase, they double every five years from the age of 65 on. So that by about age 85, um, up to half of all older adults have some memory loss. And this has a significant impact on one's abilities to live independently and to manage one's daily activities. Unfortunately, people don't get diagnosed very early with dementia often. There is so much stigma around dementia and people report being afraid to tell others that they have memory loss. Um, they know that they're gonna be treated differently. And when people have dementia, they are often excluded from other activities that they used to participate in. Roles fall away, friends fall away. And this really significantly impacts health and quality of life. And I'll talk about that a bit. Presently, there's no medical cure that's expected soon. And what we're really finding is, although we need to continue to look for approaches to treat dementia effectively, the medications that are available just allow people to function better for about a year. And the things that really seem to work are embedding, keeping people engaged within their communities in programs that allow people to develop social connections and to help create a sense of community um, by providing opportunities through inclusive activities and meaningful activities that give purpose to one's life, even when one has dementia. Now, this little image that you're seeing, um, I need to move my picture here so I can see it. Um, the most common for cause of dementia is Alzheimer's. It causes up to 50 to probably about 70%. Uh, vascular dementia is fairly common as well. It's related to having cardiovascular disease that also has impacts on, on your brain function. But there are lots of causes of dementia, and so they present differently. The trajectory of decline is different for everyone, and um, 
you know, it's pretty hard to generalize. It's like most older adults in general, you know, knowing one older adult, you can't say a lot about them until you know more about um, what chronic health conditions they may have, what limitations they may have. So with dementia, you really need to know a lot more than simply that someone has dementia. Um, okay. In 2019, Canada released its first national dementia strategy. Canada has now committed for the first time ever over $50 million over five years. Um, and it's being developed. There are strategies being developed by the Public Health Agency of Canada, often called PHAC. Um, they are coordinating resources, scaling up best practices, and trying to ensure equal levels of care across the country, which is a pretty challenging task. The key objectives of the National Dementia Strategy are listed there. And of course, it's about preventing dementia, about finding a cure. But importantly, and what I've, my, my research and work has focused on is improving the quality of life for people living with dementia and caregivers. I really do believe that you can live a good life with dementia if you have opportunities within your community. Um, a key goal of the national strategy is to eliminate stigma and promote dementia inclusive communities. So I fit in nicely there with the work I'm doing. And also equally important because people with dementia have care partners is to improve support for them as well, the resources that they need. The provinces are playing a key role in the development of this national dementia strategy. And so each of the provinces are developing, you know, dementia action plans to implement this strategy. Um, so keep your eye out for what your province is doing at this point. And uh, often the Alzheimer's Association is involved in this. Okay, so dementia and stigma. Stigma is extremely pervasive. There's a lot of stereotyping. There's a lot of status loss and discrimination against people with, with dementia. This usually reflects a lot of fear people have of getting dementia themselves and lack of awareness because dementia falls along a continuum. And as I mentioned, you know, the images, well, the images that we often see of dementia are often the most quite severe, um, the most severe um, stages of dementia where people don't recognize family members, et cetera. Um, the importance of addressing stigma is that it causes a lot of social isolation and it has a lot of negative consequences and impacts. It delays diagnosis and use of health and seeking out social supports. It causes lowered self-esteem as people begin to feel the impacts of not being able to remember certain things and impacts a sense of meaning and purpose that we all need as human beings in our lives. It contributes to poor mental health, to depression and anxiety as people get anxious about what they may not be remembering. We all know what it's like when we can't pull something up instantly. Imagine if that's compounded um, with an underlying clinical cause of, of memory loss. Overall, the impact is a decreased quality of life in persons with dementia that impacts on their, their later years. And it also spills over and has negative health impacts on care partners as well. Importantly, loneliness and social isolation is what I'm gonna be talking about a bit um, moving into our next, next slide. We don't often think about the impacts of social isolation. And in England, they've now actually got a minister of loneliness because they've realized that increasing that social isolation and loneliness increase the risk of premature death from all causes. In short, it's equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes daily. It's equivalent to being obese and also to being physically sedentary. Um, about it. Being socially isolated can actually increase your risk of dementia 50%. It increases your risk of heart disease by a third and also your risk of stroke and contributes to higher rates of depression, anxiety, and even suicide. And the highest rates of suicide are among men who are 85 and older. So it's really, and, and when you think about it, like men are more likely to be socially isolated, I think, than women. Um, and so, it's important in the older population overall to think about social isolation. And then when we layer dementia on top of that, um, you begin to see that it has, social isolation has a major impact. 
Okay, there's a number of ways to address stigma. And so what can we do about this? Well, education is a really common approach. And so the Alzheimer's Association Society is doing a lot, providing factual information about dementia. Um, contacts with older people who have memory loss, having personal relationships with them has also been used to address the stigma of dementia. And there's an intergenerational choir that was started um, by Harris and Caparella. Um, sharing meaningful activities across generations can really help um, reduce stigma, both ageism and also negative feelings older adults or, or anxiety older adults may have about younger people. And uh, studies have shown that college students have a decrease in negative attitudes and in stigma and social discomfort when they have more opportunities to interact with older adults and particularly those with memory loss. And for older adults, the benefits of uh, intergenerational program that increases opportunities for social connections is a decrease in social isolation. So the power of music to improve well-being and quality of life. Why music? Well, music is really unique in that it stimulates, it stimulates emotion, memory, and movement centers of the brain that other things don't tap into quite as easily. Um, and while it can't cure or change the force of dementia, it can help people function better um, by building elasticity in other parts of the brain. It can help people with memory loss improve their attention and engagement with others. It can also help manage symptoms such as depression, anger, and agitation, and it doesn't have side effects the way that medications can. Um, in short, it's the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex, the working memory that are affected by Alzheimer's disease. So we see people having effects that um, impact their ability to use, to verbalize, to use words, and then to remember short-term memory in particular is affected. Um, so long after losing the ability to speak though, dementia, people living with dementia can still sing, they can hum favorite songs, and that's because the brain that responds to familiar music is the last to atrophy and succumb to dementia. And some of you have probably seen that uh, YouTube video of Henry listening to a personalized playlist. It's on YouTube. And it shows how familiar songs from long, long ago can really bring people back, um, bring back a response, give them a way to um, connect that might otherwise not be there. Um, so music has really powerful and, and visible effects on the brain. And while it's not going to cure anything, it definitely has ther therapeutic effects. In fact, in Germany, music therapy is an integral part of the rehab process for people who've had strokes, brain surgery, traumatic brain injuries, et cetera. Um, it's an important way to begin to restore some neuroplasticity in the brain because the more that you don't connect, communicate, participate, actively engage, those parts of your brain begin to you know, not function as well also. And so we need to pull on the strengths that people have with memory loss by using music to tap into their emotions, their verbal abilities, um, things of that sort. So it really makes a difference in how people function and small differences in brain function can have an outsized importance. Um, anything that can improve attention and engagement is valuable and it allows us to break through some of the noise and reach the brain in ways that others do like can't. So that's the power of music. And I think all of you are aware of that being involved with music care. Um, a short summary, you know, the benefits of music for people with dementia specifically is that it can help change the mood. It can distract them. It can elevate them into a more positive, um, positive feelings. It brings out energy. It reduces stress. It helps create a sense of self-esteem because now you have an identity as a singer. It also really impacts socialization, reducing, as I mentioned earlier, loneliness and social isolation. Um, because when you're singing with a group of people, you're meeting them, you're feeling connected to them. It actually literally changes um, your hormones. Like oxytocin when you sing alone is low. When you sing socially in a group, your oxytocin levels can quadruple. And oxytocin is what's called the cuddle hormone. It allows people to bond with other people. Singing in a choir can also reduce stigma because now we're focusing on strengths rather than deficits. We're focusing on 
the fact that people can participate and contribute um, mostly as equals with a little bit of support that they're contributing to something bigger than themselves that's part of a group um, to create something beautiful. And uh, okay. A little bit about our choir study, the Voices in Motion. I conceived of Voices in Motion as an intergenerational community choir for adults with memory loss and their caregivers. I worked with a team, a multidisciplinary um, team of researchers to bring this choir together. And it was wonderful to see how people really recognized that this was an important project that we should look into. We applied for a grant and it was funded through the Alzheimer's Society for about two years and that funding ended in 2020. We started the choir in January 2018, and our purpose was to look at the impact of an intergenerational choir, because I've seen the magic of intergenerational programs previously. Um, so I was looking for high school partners to have students involved in the choir, to look at the impact of the choir on well-being and quality of life for people living with dementia and their care partners. And we wanted to also just look at whether the choir reduced dementia stigma among students. So this choir was not a sing song. It was, it was designed as a high quality arts intervention. The research that I've seen in the field of gerontology, which is my area of expertise, um, shows that when you bring in professional artists, professional choir directors, it's quite different than if you have someone just directing a sing along. So we hired a professional choir director um, who had never previously worked with a dementia choir, but brought quite a bit of expertise with dementia, both personally and professionally. She had done a master's degree looking at um, music and memory loss. Um, but it was important that it focus on music, it be strengths-based, professionally directed. And we included not just people with living with dementia, but also their care partners. We wanted to take the care partner out of that caregiving role and provide an opportunity to have fun and to see their, their family member in a different way, to see them participating and contributing and, and they weren't required to support them. The students would sit next to the person living with dementia and help them find the page. Um, the care partner often was in a different section of the choir because it was a professional choir with harmonies and soprano, alto, tenor and bass sections. And the caregiver got a kind of, it wasn't conceived of as respite, but they got to meet other caregivers who understood their situation. We partnered with local high schools and high school students, they were wonderful. I think they were a little nervous initially and they needed some support and we had to do a bit of training to help them understand how to interact with older adults, to greet them, get their choir book, sit next to them, ask them about, um, something about their lives and initiate those conversations. So the program that we started ran for um, a year and a half and it ran in the, in the, it started in the spring and then we had a summer gap and then it ran in the fall and the spring. And each season was about 12 weeks. Rehearsals were 90 minutes, uh, one hour of singing and 30 minutes of socialization. We had a break at the end and we also had a break in the middle where we would invite a duet. We didn't call, we called them duets rather than in psychology, it'd be called dyads, but duets because it was two people. Would invite a duet up to talk about themselves and share something, you know, where they had traveled, what their interests were, and then would have the high school students also about midway take a little break from singing um, because the social aspects were as important as the music, quite honestly. We wanted this to be a very balanced kind of intervention. Okay, so our intergenerational choir program, this, this is a little bit redundant, sorry about that. Um, currently though, what you need to know is that it's continued to be professionally conducted since the, um, once the funding ended, we became a nonprofit because I really don't believe you can start a program and then just take it away and say, sorry, our research is done. So it became a nonprofit and I engaged in a lot of fundraising to help support it. And, um, and recently it's become a charity. And we've got three in-person community-based choirs and one online choir currently. And even through COVID, the choir ended right as COVID was starting really um, in the, and right as COVID was, it was actually the last season of the choir that COVID started. 
um, kind of midway and we had to flip to online. And the connections were so strong between our members at that point that the choir was able to continue online um, for two years of COVID. And now they're finally meeting in person again, which has been wonderful because it certainly isn't as good to meet on Zoom. And we weren't doing any research on the impact of the choir during Zoom. But okay, um, as people walked into the choir program, they were giving music binders. They could have lyrics only, or they could have a full score. We also gave participants CDs to listen to and practice at home. And later we flipped to um, creating a YouTube channel and making um, the music available on YouTube so they could practice at home in between choir sessions. And this I think helped amplify the sense of identity as a singer and it gave caregivers something to do with their family member that was meaningful to both of them when they were um, practicing at home. All of the repertoires that the choir performed were, were organized around specific themes. Um, one season we had songs of love and friendship Another season was living in technicolor. Another season was people who meet people. More recently, this past fall, we had um, when the choir finally was able to start meeting together. They did a concert, and it was called "So Happy Together," and they sang a lot of songs about being together with friends. The choir repertoire includes both new songs and old songs. We sing older songs like "La Vie en Rose." But we also teach them new songs and often songs in different languages. Um, so there's been some African songs that even involve some fairly complex um, hand movements. Um, and people were able to do it and they appreciated being treated respectfully and expected to learn and to practice and, and to contribute. Okay, our study was both quantitative and qualitative. For the quantitative section, we used a very intensive repeated measures design. And you don't need to know much about this other than that each person served as their own control. We brought them into our lab three to four times during each choir season. And that's a lot, like every month we were running them in for like a two hour, two hours of data collection. We also did self-report surveys with them to gather data on health and depression, caregiver burden. We did extensive neuropsychological assessments on cognition. We did physiological assessments looking at gait and respiratory function. The qualitative part of the study involved doing narrative interviews with our participants in their homes and also doing some focus groups like with the students and sometimes with the caregivers. In the end, our sample size for the study, the research study, I mean, we have many more members now, um, and our numbers are growing now that we're meeting in person again. They dwindled a bit during COVID. Um, but we had a total sample size in the end of about 35. What I'm showing here is a um, data collection results from caregivers and people with dementia, um, 23 duets. I just wanted you to see basically that the average age of caregivers was about 68, but it ranged in age. They ranged in age from 48 to 89. Um, Persons living with dementia, the average age was about 80 years old, but they ranged in age from 69 to 98. Most of the care partners were female, 83%. Persons with dementia, about 52% of them were female. Um, about half of our participants were spouses and about a third of them were adult children among care partners. And in terms of the mini mental, um, which is a measure of cognition, the average um, mini mental was about 20, which is moderate dementia. And we also had about 29 students participating. Just gives you a sense of the, of the sample who participated in our study. Um, we collected, I just wanted to give you also a really short, um, incomplete, but um, summary of some of the measures that we collected. There's the caregiver distress, which is the Zeret uh, 12 item measure. It's called caregiver burden or distress. We looked at social activities because we were curious if um, participation in social activities changed over the course of participating in the choir. And we did, of course, a mini mental and some other cognitive measures to kind of stage and understand where our participants were at. We also did an assessment um, of depression using the PHQ-9, which is the nine item scale. So a little bit about our findings. 
Um, a key finding was that caregiver distress declined over the course of the choir. Um, caregivers typically had a level of distress that was up to moderate, and um, it significantly declined over the course of the choir seasons. We had a four month summer break. And what was interesting about this was it provided us with a chance to really um, discern whether, you know, what happened with distress during that break. And indeed, what we saw was that caregiver distress levels rose again. Now they didn't decline as much after that summer break when the choir started up the following fall. And we think this may be because, you know, dementia progresses over time. And so caregivers did have more um, challenges um, when they returned in the fall. But again, we did see caregiver distress begin to drop during the fall season after that four month summer break. And that made us decide that we needed to have kind of a more year round choir season um, because the choir clearly provided a, you know, a community of support kind of wraparound care. Um, okay. It was a really complex design that we had um, for this study, and it's allowed us to do some really advanced statistics and to be fairly confident in our findings despite our small sample size. Um, what we also found was that there was a significant increase in social activities and that that was associated with caregiver distress. So being around more people was definitely very helpful for caregivers um, in terms of making them feel less burdened. I'm not going to go into the details around this modeling, but what I want you, to, what I wanted you to know is that having more social activities, keeping caregivers distressed, keeping caregivers engaged, help reduce caregiver distress. Now, the most important finding, in some ways, one of the most important findings was that participants in the, in the choir um, living with memory loss showed the rate of cognitive decline was significantly slower than what might have been expected in people who weren't participating in a choir who had memory loss. And this is really exciting to us because we don't think we're changing the course of, of the dementia. But what we think is happening here is that having social support, being engaged, having your mind more involved in meaningful activities, like this is not a um, this is not like going to daycare and just uh, engaging in activities that may not reflect your personal interests. Engaging in something that you found important really mattered and having the support to continue participating in that and being around people where you couldn't do anything wrong. It was a very safe and caring environment. Lifted the stress that people living with dementia feel. And we all know that when we're stressed, when we're anxious, we can't remember things as well. And so what we really think is happening here is that, you know, even though dementia progresses over time, if we can lift um, that strain that they feel, knowing that they have dementia, feeling anxious, just allow them to, to enjoy themselves, to interact with other people, that that has really significant impacts on their health and their ability to function importantly. So if we look at depression, we also see that participating in the choir over all of the, when I say waves of assessment, um, that's over seasons, seeing that we see that it also, participation in the choir also reduced depression. Now depression levels typically were at a level five, which is not high enough to warrant treatment, but it is enough to impact on quality of life. And so reducing that depression, um, again, is I think a really important finding. Our qualitative findings also illustrate some of the things that we hypothesized about in the quantitative findings. Um, and in short, it's that our choir participants become part of a community and an extended family. Um, and they particularly appreciated, like, you know, it isn't a sing along. This is not campfire singing, you know, one said. We do a reasonable job. Um, they were surprised at how good they sounded. Um, and uh, they appreciated being required to try to learn new songs and learn songs in other languages and have to do 
movements with their hands when we were singing an African song. Um, some of the things that I think lessons learned about how we create community for, for duets is that the chorister with memory loss um, always had a student or a volunteer for support and also interaction. And the icebreakers and the rehearsal breaks were really important, allowing space for personal stories so that people got to know each other um, with some support so they could talk with one another at the end of the choir and say, oh, you know, I didn't know that about you, aha. Um, a lot of close friendships developed and we ended up ultimately by the end of year two of the choir, um, creating activities like picnics and tailgate parties during COVID where we would meet in a parking lot, people would bring their chairs and we would just sit outside and, and sing and everyone would bring their own food and have a little picnic. Um, I think what's exciting about the choir approach is that it doesn't have to be expensive. What it needs is just some, some leadership. So just a few comments from people with dementia. You're making new friends. Things like when you're singing, you're happy, you're smiling. They appreciated, everyone had like a name tag that they wore so that you could meet people, get to know their names. And it wasn't just about singing, as you can see. And they really did become a, a community of care. People really liked that, that they were making a meaningful contribution. They felt that it was magical to sing together and to hear each other and to hear the different sections because you know sometimes you have the tenor singing their part and then the sopranos will sing their part and then you bring it together and it, it is quite magical when that moment happens. Now the students, um, this is a part of the study I was particularly interested in. They did feel nervous and uncomfortable at first, um, but over time and with the supports that we provided, they realized that people with dementia are just like other people. Um, it became a lot easier. And this is a quote I really love from students. When you hear people just talking about people suffering from memory loss, you assume they're old and near death. Um, and this last statement, I think the stigma surrounding something like memory loss is just so, so stupid. A number of the students that were in high school, it's now been four years, um, have ended up coming to my university as university students. They've decided to become nursing students to work with older adults. A few have applied for medical school. I think this is a great way not only to reduce dementia stigma, but to get students interested in working with older adults in general. One of the 16-year-old students, Priscilla Kumar, was so inspired by her experience in the choir, she wrote a book called I Remember, and it's written for children, and she illustrated it. You can see the cover, beautiful illustrations in watercolors, and it's being sold on the voicesinmotion.choirs.org website. Um, but a lovely story about how a song can tap into a memory and break through um, to a person that might not otherwise have been responding. It was really important to have an end of season concert that was public. And the first concert we had over 300 people come in and it was just amazing because you couldn't tell watching people perform necessarily who had dementia and who didn't. Um, as one person said, it was a great equalizer. We're all the same. It shows anybody can do anything, disease or no disease, you just get on with it. So, A few more quotes from students about purpose, about how their views evolved. You can just look at those for a moment. This photo is of the choir. They were invited to sing in the parliament um, at the parliamentary lunch for the Alzheimer's that the Alzheimer's Society hosted. And it meant so much to them to do this performance in front of all the legislators of BC. And a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. I think the best way to give you a sense of the choir is to play this um, video. I'm just gonna play a few minutes, um, but it, and it, this was done while they were meeting on YouTube, but it gives you a sense of the youth involved and of how, how this choir really works. So. If you ever find yourself stuck in the middle of the sea 
of saving the world to find you. That gives you a, a good sense of kind of how how the choir sounds and the sense of community that's there. Um, okay, we just recently had a spring gala concert and it was held in the Alex Golden Hall and we had quite good attendance for it. Um, what was exciting about it too was that a couple of local artists, West, my friend, um, who are who are very popular in Victoria. And Catherine Calder, our, um, our, um, she's the music laureate in Victoria, um, performed alongside us. And I think that also um, just kind of validated the, the choir, their, their excellence in general. Um, they got to sing a song that West, my friend, wrote called How Could I Not Sing? And I had heard this song um, three years ago and had mentioned to our choir director you know, it'd be lovely. It's the perfect song for our choir to sing. And so we had planned to sing with them two years ago, but then COVID hit and that didn't happen. So it was a really joyful moment, um, May 15th, when we finally got to perform all together again in person and uh, meant a lot. Okay, I wanted to mention that during COVID, we, I didn't stand still. Um, I was working with a team to do a podcast series. We called it Call to Mind. And we invited a number of duets who were choir participants um, to do some audio recordings, some audio diaries to share some of their caregiving experiences. And we didn't know what we'd get, and we got a lot of a lot of magic. Um, the goal of this podcast series was to bring attention to caregivers who often don't have a voice in social media. Um, there's a lot of educational podcasts out there, but we don't hear caregivers talking about um, those tender moments, the challenging moments, and just providing a bit of a balanced um, perspective on caregiving. So I just wanted to play one little bit. So it's a, we ended up with a four-part podcast series, and our goal was basically to increase empathy for care partners. Um, to shift the narrative away from one of tragedy, decline, caregiving, burden, and fear to stories that show the love, tenderness, and joy, but also the challenges. So I'm just gonna play a little excerpt here so you can see again the impact of music. Um, Brenda is here with her 101-year-old mother who was in long-term care and Brenda brought her home to take care of her. And her mom loved music and Brenda created a personalized playlist for her that she would put on in the morning. And so this is how her mom's name is Dorothy or Dot. We called her Dot. And this is how Dot's morning would start with music. This is Call to Mind, a podcast series from the University of Victoria, audio stories of love and memory loss. A beautiful morning. Lovely, isn't it? Oh, it's a beautiful day. I had a wonderful feeling. Everything's going my way. Do you know who I am? No, not at all. Not really. No. Oh, okay. I'm Brenda, your daughter. Oh, my daughter. Brenda Lee. Brenda Lee. Yeah. I'd love to get into the world of coaching people who look after people 
Okay. Um, so there's four podcasts and you're welcome to listen to them. They're on the call to mind. They're on call to mind podcast.com. Um, they all have a lot of music, a good amount of music in them, but they also provide this perspective of caregivers because it's heartbreaking when Brenda realizes her mom doesn't know her name. Um, Brenda was her mom. Brenda was born when her mom was in her mid to late forties. And so her mom would remember Brenda's brother in his seventies, but didn't know her name and didn't quite remember who she was. She knew she was familiar though. And Brenda used music very effectively to just um, add quality of life to her mom's um, life, even when her mom was in pretty advanced stages of dementia. So this is really just a short summary of the choir benefits, just to reiterate and kind of wrap this up, um, that people living with dementia do have the ability to learn, experience, and perform songs at a high, in a high quality way that music can give people living with memory loss and expressive language, even when they're losing words, they can still tap into parts of the brain and through music, words come back. It just flows at times. It gives them an identity as a singer when other roles are disappearing and friendships are disappearing. Having intergenerational choirs and just choirs in general increases social connections, um, but the intergenerational component brings a lot of joy in and uh, also rehumanizes dementia. It challenges those stigmatizing um, social narratives that are unfortunately all too common. Um, I was shocked about two months ago, I was looking on TikTok talk and there's a lot of um, uh, just really disrespectful videos. I understand some caregivers get really, care partners get really um, stressed, but some of them are videotaping uh, people with memory loss without their consent. And I found this really disturbing and ended up writing an editorial on this, um, suggesting that, you know, we need to think about the ethics behind this. Like when someone can't give consent, their family member shouldn't be taping and posting public videos in a way that um, provokes ridicule. So we need to rehumanize dementia through these programs that show that, um, that remind us these are people. Um, in short, choir communities can be a safe and caring place for caregivers, for people living with dementia. Um, they increase quality of life because they're joyful, they're social. They can reduce stigma and students really benefit as well because we typically hang around people of our own age and many students don't have grandparents living near them anymore. And um, so this provides opportunities to know people that aren't in your age group and to develop friendships across generations. Um, I really believe that choirs, and this is where Kate Mulligan would, Dr. Mulligan at the University of Toronto would agree, um, that choirs should be part of a social prescription for dementia care in Canada, that when someone's diagnosed with dementia, that they should be offered opportunities to join a choir that's dementia inclusive, um, that provides accommodations if you have memory loss and encourages people to to remain involved. A number of our participants had been involved in choirs, but when they could no longer remember the words without having their notebook in front of them, they had to drop out of the choir. The support wasn't there. And I really think that needs to change. So I wrote this op-ed um, a few years ago. Next steps. I'd like to see more of these choirs replicated. It just takes some leadership. They can be started in any community. And we have a training program on the Voices in Motion Choir website. Um, I'm also working to support caregivers to do audio recordings, and we have a manual coming out. I think it's going to be called Audio. Awe is for the um, for the sense of awe that we get when we when we're doing recordings and telling our stories. And D is for the delight we feel in hearing some of those stories. And O is O is for the oh, I didn't know that moment. I think recording some moments with our family members, with caregivers or persons living with dementia can help connect and inspire other caregivers and just keep, provide sort of another level of, of support, knowing that others are doing these things and capturing these stories. I also think that we need to begin making personalized playlists more easily available for care recipients. And so I'm looking into using voice for easy access to music. For example, the Amazon Echo Show is a video um, 
display that shows words and you can actually program in personalized playlists, but you do have to have a Amazon um, Prime account to be able to, to access the music. But this isn't done enough where we create these personalized lists and we need to make them more accessible. I wanted to just post a picture of our research team. We had faculty from music, from sociology, I'm from nursing, and, and Dr. Stuart McDonald's from psychology. And on the right in this picture, you can see Erica Fairberg, our choral director, who's absolutely amazing and has now unfortunately stepped down. We're in transition and, and a new choir director is coming in because she's moved away. It took a lot of people to do the research, which um, so I wanted to at least acknowledge them. Um, a lot of hard work over several years and papers are coming out have some have come out and many more are kind of in the pipeline right now we're waiting for them to be published we partnered with two um, schools that you can see listed at the bottom and then of course it took a lot of other support over the last four years to get this research done including the podcast so i've listed those sponsors here and here, of course, is the link to the Voices in Motion choirs. And I thank you for your attention. And I think I ran on a little bit too long because I can't see my clock. So I look forward to any um, comments and questions. And I'm going to end my slideshow here and stop my screen sharing. Great. Thank you, Deborah. That was very informative uh, and very inspiring. I love to see the comments from both the students. Um, you know, as well as the pe the participants, which was great. So I'll invite anybody to turn their camera on if you have a question, um, to just jump right in and, and ask Deborah a question. And I guess in the meantime, I had a, a just a thought because your last uh, your last couple slides talked about supporting the replication of this. Um, is there any tips, you know, like if this was something somebody was considering, is there like a couple quick tips that you could give us to consider, you know, from your own experience? Mm -hmm. I'd encourage you to reach out to me and I'm happy to provide some support and information. Mm -hmm. um, I think the best, a, a key element is finding a really good partner so that you have a rehearsal space and a good place to begin is identifying a local high school or, or a local middle school where you have a champion. Um, and even kids, I think, we ended up um, implementing a choir in long-term care before COVID happened, and it actually worked amazingly well. I thought it wouldn't, honestly, because dementia is so advanced in residential care in nursing homes, but the families loved having something to come and do with their family member, and they often brought their young children with them, and even pets, like they'd bring in a dog, and, and uh, it really brought life into the place. And... Uh, so I would say, you know, pick your partners carefully, make sure they have the commitment. Um, I had a little bit of funding and I, I was trying to replicate. And what I found was that some partners didn't have a commitment. They were happy to have a program for one season, but they weren't going to continue it on unless I was able to provide more funding. And it doesn't, it costs about $5,000 per choir season to have a good choral director. It can be a music therapist. It can be a professional choir director. But what you need is someone that really understands that it isn't a sing-along, it is sections. You should have a concert at the end. So structure your program to provide opportunities for learning. Um, that intergenerational component, I, I think, really makes a difference. People really looked forward to coming and seeing the young people every week. Yeah, and I, I was intrigued with the... Um the emphasis on the social component at the beginning of your presentation that you know a significant portion so um oh and and there is a comment there is a thank you but what what um what training like how did you provide the training for the students so that they would be able to understand how to uh, carry conversation or you know participate more fully you know we ended up being pretty pretty directed each week they would arrive a little bit early and would give them a question and say, okay, you know, we, we, we initially did a more formal or overview of dementia. And I think that actually created more anxiety and concerns. It was a little too biomedical in perspective. Mm -hmm. And really what we want them to do is to just see this as a social opportunity to get to know someone. So if I were to do a training with students, again, I would keep it very 
focused on here's the kinds of things you should be doing, greet them at the door, take their jacket, get their notebook, walk them to the seat. Here's the question of the week. And just kind of ease that way because the first few weeks when we started, students were sitting together in clusters like they do. And they just need that, that support to kind of figure out how they fit in. Exactly, and we have a comment, a great suggestion, obviously, um, to network with choir teachers, which is, you know, choral teachers in the area, which is great. I just, I wanted to unpack, um, you talked a little bit about the value of it being arts intervention um, versus, versus a led sing-along. Can you just unpack that a little bit as to why that's significant to your, your program? Yeah, I think it gives it more meaning and purpose in having a concert at the end. Um, so having that, that status as a formal choir that's going to perform um, brings in commitment, commitment to learning, commitment to practicing. Whereas, you know, I went to a sing along with my mom yesterday at a local senior center and it was really fun. Um, but it's, it's not like you're learning new songs, you're singing familiar things that everybody can sing and that's lovely. Um, but we're trying to put a new face on dementia here by showing they can participate in pretty high level ways. So I just want to mention Cindy Bouvet is on this um, webinar and she started a choir in Vancouver and uh, did an amazing job getting it up and running with a local high school and it was finding a champion there and then, you know, um, the choir director was interested in leading it and Cindy I don't know if you'd like to say anything about your experience and any tips you have. Um, thank you, Deborah. Um, it, certainly, I was inspired by Deborah and her work. And when I saw her work, it was something that I just, um, my background is I'm a recreation therapist. And I knew, I just knew that it could work. Um, and we just needed to find the right partners. And I was very fortunate to find the right people. Um, and we got it up and running very quickly with um, some support from De Deborah and Erica. And uh, then COVID hit, and unfortunately, we haven't been able to get going again. But um, you know, many of the things that Deborah spoke about—the socialization, the community, the camaraderie, the support between individuals, um, the love of music, and also the challenge of creating harmony. Uh, Making—I've seen many, many sing-alongs, and this was different. And this was image enhancing and helping people to really believe in themselves and for care partners to believe in their spouses. Wonderful. Well, on, on that note, um, I want to thank, thank you for that, Cindy, as well, the, the tidbit. And um, just to, to circle back, we have a, a Sherry Dupuy who teaches recreational therapy coming on in Waterloo. So it's kind of nice to, right. to have you with us yeah. as well. So on that note, um, thank you very, very much, Deborah, for sharing your story um, and, and your research. It's, it's uh, very moving. Um, so thank you. And uh, I hope your mother is well, that you're able to go <laughs> in. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you to everybody. I'll see you next season. Please check our, our website for our future offerings. And we'll see you next season. Thank you all so much. Thank you.